Hi, everyone. I have the very distinct pleasure of introducing Brian Nolt for today's seminar speaker. Brian comes to us from Cornell Agritech. He's currently sitting in, I'm assuming, a very snowy Geneva, New York. Yeah? Okay. Oh, yeah. Similar here. Similar here. Um, Brian has a very diverse program. He works uh, specifically in vegetable production systems, and he asks an array of questions surrounding those vegetable production systems, looking at more basic ecology questions regarding things like pollinator ecology and health, um, virus vector relationships, and insect dispersal as well. Um, and he uses that information, leverages it, so we can develop effective pest management programs in those vegetable production systems within the state of New York. Um, today, uh, he'll be talking a little bit about a virus vector relationship, um, onion thrips and iris yellow spot virus, which is a pasco virus. Um, I won't say too much more, Brian, I promise. Um, and the reason I know so much about Brian's program is because I was fortunate enough to get my PhD in his program almost two years ago, which is insane. Um, but with further ado, I'll let Brian take it away. Thank you, Brian. Great. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ashley, for that introduction. I assume you can see my screen okay and hear me all right. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, um, I, I really rather prefer to give this presentation to you all in person in West Lafayette than in my office here in Geneva, but you know that's the way it is. So I'm hopeful that one day I'll make it to West Lafayette and uh, be able to meet you all in, in person. So at any rate, um, as Ashley mentioned, I'm gonna talk about virus uh, vector or vector virus relationships and cropping systems with um, a case study of onion strips and IRS, IYSV. And before I do, uh, I know that many of you probably know that Cornell University is in New York, but you may be less familiar about Cornell Agritech. And let's see. Okay, we'll do it this way. So uh, both campuses are in the central part of New York in the heart of the Finger Lakes. So main campus is in Ithaca, which is at the south end of Cayuga Lake. And Cornell Agritech is in Geneva, which is on the north end of Seneca Lake. And to get between the two, you have to drive, and it's about an hour and 15 minutes. So for many decades, our campus in Geneva was called the New York State Agricultural Experiment Station. That's a mouthful. So a couple of years ago, we had a rebranding effort to come up with a name that was a shorter, and also maybe a little bit more modern. So we. The, the decision was to come up with Cornell Agritech. So that's why we are called that. Okay, so this is a, an aerial view of our campus. And if I, here we go. So it's right here, it's Cornell Agritech. And we're looking towards the Southeast. So this is the North end of Seneca Lake. And we are home to professorial faculty in the departments of entomology and food science as well as those that are in the School of Integrated Plant Science units of horticulture, plant breeding and genetics, and plant pathology and plant microbiology. We are also home to the New York State IPM program and the USDA Plant Genetics Research Unit and USDA Grape Genetics Research Unit. So the mission at Cornell Agritech is to create future food and ag systems by working across disciplines to explore questions from all sides and then translate our discoveries into practical solutions that help growers and businesses thrive. And we focus on specialty crops. So that's tree fruit, small fruit, grapes, veggies, hops, hemp, shrub, willow, and turf. So what do I do it? Cornell Agritech, well, I lead efforts in the vegetable entomology program. And I've listed four general research foci in my program. The first two more fundamental in nature, the last two more applied in nature. So I studied the biology and ecology of insect pests that attack vegetable crops. And I've included all of the ones that I've worked with on this slide and then there are others as well. Uh, I also studied the epidemiology of insect transmitted plant pathogens, especially viruses in vegetable systems. And then I use this information to develop IPM programs for these pests. And then I also really enjoy working with growers to implement these IPM programs. 
The project that I'm going to talk about today includes a relationship between a major pest of onion, which is onion thrips, and they also are a vector to a major pathogen that impacts onion, and that's iris yellow spot virus. I'm going to talk about these relationships within the onion agroecosystem, with the idea being that some of this information then can be used to develop management strategies for both. So onion thrips and iris yellow spot disease are major threats, not only to the New York onion industry, but to the US onion industry. So annual losses from damage reach about 90 million annually. If you add the cost of insecticides used to kill thrips, you add another 12 and a half million. Over the past, I guess, 13 years now, I've led a multidisciplinary research team to address these issues. So those folks in my lab have included former research associate, Cynthia Sue, and student, Eric Smith. They were both in my program at the time iris yellow spot virus was first detected in New York State, which was in 2007. Everybody knows Ashley. And then my current technician, Riley Hardy. Then I also have collaborators at Agritech, includes plant virologist, Mark Fuchs, fellow entomologist, Tony Shelton, and then folks on main campus, weed scientist, Tony DiTomaso, entomologist and aerobiologist, Elson Shields, and then Christy Hopeking, who is a Cornell Crawford Extension educator who has responsibilities with onions and works more closely with growers in the central and western part of the state. Now, I'm gonna say we a lot during this presentation. And when I say we, I really mean these folks, <laughs> especially Ashley, Eric, and uh, Cynthia. This is a outline of what I'm gonna to cover today. I'm gonna to start off with a relatively lengthy background about onion production and as well as onion thrips and IYSV biology. So just gonna warn you, but it's important because you need to know all of this background to then understand why the types of ecology and management systems that I'm gonna talk about uh, make, make sense, or hopefully they will. Uh, then I'm gonna talk about some of the research in my program on onion thrips ecology and IYSV epidemiology that uh, filled gaps that we didn't know about that were important for then developing management strategies for thrips and IYSV. I'm going to start off with some background about onions and onion production. So this map shows all of the major onion producing areas in the US, so all the circles. Um, so overall, there's about 125,000 acres of bulb onions grown in the US with production just under 7 billion pounds per year. A majority of our production occurs in the Western US. However, in the Great Lakes region, New York leads the production. Within New York State, about 40% of our dry bulb onions are produced in the southeastern part in the black dirt in Orange County, with the remaining 60% spread throughout central and western New York. We've got 7,400 acres. We're ranked seventh in acres in the US with average production about $43 million per year. This is an aerial view of the Elba Muck, and this is home to the second largest onion producing area within New York State. If you look at this area, it's like, oh, that could almost be a lake or a swamp. Well, you know what? You'd be right, because in 1900, that's exactly what it was. And they cleared all the stumps and the trees out of that area, and it left these really fertile, soils that are very, very high in organic matter. Really great for growing vegetables. And there are a lot of mucks, not just the elbow muck, but all scattered throughout New York and, and really uh, throughout Eastern Canada as well. Now, we plant onions anywhere from the very end of March through about mid-May. And most of the crop is established by planting seeds, but 25% is transplanted. And now let me explain why. So essentially by transplanting onions, you give the crop a head start. And why is that important? Well, the more leaves on the plant at the time that crop determines it's gonna to start to bulb, the larger that bulb is. So the more leaves, the larger the bulb. The larger the bulb, more money. So that's one aspect. The other is by transplanting, especially an early maturing variety, you can harvest that crop earlier. And oftentimes, if you're the first one to harvest, there's a more of a premium. So you get more money because you have a larger bulb and you get more money because you're filling a time when you really need those onions. Okay, 
Uh, then in June and in July, the crop is intensively managed to control weeds, diseases, and insects. And then harvest can be as early as mid-July through early October. Many of you may not know, but onion is actually a biennial. It's got a two-year life cycle. But for onion bulb production, it's grown as an annual. So seeds are planted in the spring, and then the crop matures late summer, early fall. Now, not every single bulb is going to be harvested. Some of them actually slip through the harvester, believe it or not. And if that bulb survives our harsh winters, which some do, uh, they will actually put down roots and leaves the following spring. And if you let it go long enough, it'll actually produce a scape that will then produce seeds. We call these volunteer onions. Now these onions aren't worth anything. They're, they, they have no marketable yield at all. But the reason I'm mentioning it to you now is because they could be a source for the virus and potentially a host for thrips. And I'll get uh, into that more later. Moving on now to onion thrips. Despite its name, onion thrips is actually a prolificous pest with a huge host range, including hundreds of species. And it's a major pest of onion worldwide. If you look at the map now and all of the red circles, these are all areas where onion thrips is considered a major pest of onion. The sole exception is down here in the Vidalia onion production region where it takes a back seat to tobacco thrips, Franklinella fusca. Onion thrips damage onion by feeding on foliage. And when they do so, they remove chlorophyll. And if the infestation is high enough, they'll actually turn the leaves white. And you can kind of see from this picture that this plant has whiter leaves than this one. And if this damage occurs early enough in the, the, uh, the growth stage of the crop, you can have yield reduced by up to 60%. Onion thrips also can spread plant pathogens. We know it's the major vector of iris yellow spot virus that I'll talk about in a little bit. It also is a known uh, vector of the bacterial pathogen Pantoea anonatus that causes bacterial center rot. And then we also know that it's feeding on foliage can exacerbate foliar outbreaks of, thing, of things like a uh, purple blotch and stem filling leaf blight. And to make matters worse, this insect is notorious for developing resistance to insecticides. So it's a, it's a pretty bad actor. We do know where onion thrips are in the landscape. We know that they overwinter in the soil. We know that they emerge in late April and May. At this time, onions aren't available for them. So they've gotta be in other hosts. So we know that they'll feed on a number of weeds that you can find along ditches next to onion fields. We can find them on volunteer onions in non-rotated onion fields. And by the way, about 95 to 99% of our onion fields are non-rotated. Um, but because of some of the information I'm gonna tell you in a little bit, uh, our growers send migrant crews out to rogue these volunteers out before thrips colonize. So that's, that's a good thing. We also can occasionally have onion thrips come in on imported transplants from the Southwestern US. And then finally, we know that alfalfa and wheat are excellent hosts for onion thrips. And then when alfalfa gets cut and when wheat matures, the thrips will then migrate in mass out of this. And we suspect that some of these may go into onion fields, but right now it's only anecdotal information. One of the reasons why onion thrips is such a, a bad, bad problem is that it can complete its life cycle very quickly. So a complete generation can occur within 17 days, so just a little over two weeks, given the temperatures that we typically have during the onion growing season. So that allows multiple generations. This diagram shows the period of when onion thrips can be an issue during the onion growing season. Typically, adults aren't coming off of those other hosts that I just told you about and interested in infesting onion until those onions have about three to four leaves. And that's gonna happen sometime in June, typically mid to late June. So in some years, you could have as many as three to four of these overlapping generations in a kind of a late maturing field. Now with an early maturing variety that gets harvested in July, maybe you only have a couple generations. And now finally, Let's talk about the virus, iris yellow spot virus. 
which is a single-stranded negative sense RNA virus, and it belongs to the family Tosboviridae. So you probably have heard of tomato-spotted wilt virus, which is a major virus that attacks a number of other vegetable crops, especially in the southeast and also in the west. Um, a close cousin, also a Tospo virus. Uh, IYSV has a wide host range, uh, over 40 plant species, and the virus causes iris yellow spot disease and onion worldwide. Back to our map, all of the areas that are filled in are areas where IYSV can be commonly found. The exceptions are Michigan and Wisconsin, and also down here in the Vidalia onion production region in Georgia. So what does IYSV do to onion? Well, if onion is grown for seed production, which it is not in New York, in fact, it's kind of isolated more in the Pacific Northwest, that the lesions can form on the scapes and then cause the seed heads to fall over and then you can't harvest the seed. For bulb production, the lesions on the leaves can reduce the ability of the plant to photosynthesize and you can have smaller bulbs. But what's really bad is when you have these severe infections that kill the plants before they're mature. Now, when an onion plant matures, the leaves fall over normally. When they die prematurely, they die, we call standing up. So you can see this, that they're dying, the necks are soft. And what we find is that these plants that die prematurely end up getting hammered by bacterial bulb rot pathogens. So you basically can have a complete crop loss when this happens. This figure here shows the temporal progression of IYSV epidemics in onion fields. So on the y-axis, we have the percentage of sites within onion fields that test positive for IYSV over time. And what you see is that, yeah, relatively low levels of the virus through really mid to late July. And then you can have these exponential increases of virus where the thrips are just spreading the virus from plant to plant within fields and then also between fields, or at least that's what we suspected. Here is an onion field that has been completely 100% infected with a virus, um, complete loss. So you see these plants, yeah, there are plants in the field, but they're about the third the size they should be. And the bulbs are maybe half the size that they normally would be. And then again, because they died standing up, they're gonna be ravaged or they were ravaged with bacterial bulb rot. This is one of triple, triple G fields, by the way, Ashley. We have a pretty good handle of where the sources of IYSV are in New York. So we know that plants imported from the southwestern US can have the virus and then are transplanted in New York. We know that volunteer onions can be a source. So those from non-rotated onion fields, but again, as I mentioned, these are now roped out pretty uh, religiously, which is good. And then we can find them in coal piles. In fact, the very first case of IYSV in New York State was found on a plant in a coal pile in, in uh, Elba. There are a number of non-annual plant species that are hosts for the virus and also hosts for the thrips. And then finally, this virus is not seed transmitted in onion. Like other TOSPO viruses, IYSV is transmitted by thrips in a persistent and propagative manner. And it can only be transmitted by onion thrips to onion. It has to be acquired in the larval stage. Adults cannot acquire it. Once the larva acquires the virus, the virus replicates within the midgut, then the virus moves into the salivary glands at which time second instars and, and adults can transmit it. It cannot be passed along to offspring. And uh, a work that Ashley did, she found that uh, fecundity of infected adults were not affected, but these adults live longer. So if a virulifrous insect can live longer, that means it has longer time to feed and transmit the virus. It enables them maybe to fly to another plant or to another field to pass that virus on. So that's it's, it's certainly a serious issue. That concludes the background. Now I'm gonna talk about some of the work done in my program to fill the gaps in knowledge about thrips ecology and IYSV epidemiology. Uh, Roger Jones, who is a renowned plant virologist from Australia, uh, wrote a really cool research review article back in 20, uh, or 2004. And in that article, 
He lists epidemiological information that can be very useful in developing management strategies for plant viruses and cropping systems. And here are some of the, well, here are five of the major pieces of information that should be known. The first is to know where the primary infection source or sources are, are in the landscape. To know if local spread of the virus can occur from plant to plant or within a field, um, even adjacent fields. How that virus could be introduced to new locations where it isn't currently found. How that virus can survive outside of growing periods. Well, that's pretty important in a state like New York where you have you know, basically nothing happening for maybe four months, five, okay, six months out of the year. Uh, so how does it bridge those seasons? if it can at all. And then also, what are the factors favoring epidemics? Relatively early on, we had answers to number four and five. We knew that the virus could bridge our seasons in volunteer onions and in certain non-annual weed species. In terms of factors favoring epidemics, hot, dry weather, high thrips populations. And obviously these are positively correlated. Um, so we knew that in years where we had cool, wet summers, we didn't have many threats. We didn't really have many problems with IYSV. But it was these other three questions or points that we didn't have a good handle on. So I'm going to talk about how we address those now. Starting with the first objective, which was to identify habitats within the onion ecosystem that were most influential in fostering IYSV epidemics. The hypothesis was that fields transplanted with imported onion plants would be most influential. Now let me exp explain why, a couple reasons. First of all, IYSV infected onion transplants imported from the Southwestern US had previously been documented to have IYS symptoms. So in Colorado, for example, 0.4 to 5% of imported plants from Arizona and California had symptoms, all right? So we thought, huh, I wonder if plants coming into New York were infected. So uh, soon after Ashley arrived in my program, she looked into this. So because these plants come right out of these crates out of tractor trailers, there's, they're bare, we call them bare root because you can see the roots. I mean, it's amazing that these things can actually live. Uh, they're, they're, they're in terrible shape. And what we were concerned about that if they were infected with a virus, we might not be able to detect it because they're not, the, the titer may be really, really low. So what Ashley did was she took these plants, potted them up, put them in the greenhouse in thrips proof cages, made sure that there are no thrips. And then after two months, allowing the plants to grow, ideally, if they're anywhere infected, the virus would replicate at a level that we could easily detect it using Dasilisa. And Dasilisa is a fantastic tool to use for detecting the virus. So she grabbed five different varieties, and in the first year, 2014, she looked at 829 plants. Guess what? No hits. So we look, well, okay, that's fine. Well, always do things more than one year. <laughs> that's one thing I've ever learned. Never stop after one year. Uh, 2015, repeated the study. A little under 800 plants. Guess what? Seven were positive. Still seven. That's not very many, right? So if, even if you average the years, the average percentage of plants that were infected with IYSV is 0.4%. Well, ironically, that's exactly what they found in Colorado. But 0.4%, eh, that's probably negligible, right? Well, let's look at that a little bit more closely. Here's a 30 acre onion field in New York State. Most of our growers plant around 130,000 plants per acre. If you take our average of 0.4% infected plants, times 130,000 plants that are planted, transplanted per acre, you get 520 infected plants. Yeah, 520, yeah, that, that does seem maybe a little bit higher, doesn't it? Well, this is a 30 acre field. So now you take the 30 acres, multiply it by the 520 infected plants. Uh-oh, we got a problem. 15,600 IYSV infected plants potentially in this field. Now we're talking about a pretty sizable inoculum source if these plants are coming in infected. So another component that why we thought maybe transplant fields were a major source or the major source was that we thought that these 
fields are going to be preferentially colonized and thrips populations are going to get started in them first. So we looked into this in 2007 and 2008. This is uh, Cynthia Sue conducted this work. And she sampled onion plants and transplanted onion fields and in seeded fields in June before there were any foliar insecticides applied. And she found indeed there were significantly more adults in transplanted fields than in seeded ones. All right, why? Well, we believe it's because the plants were a lot larger. I mean, these, these uh, direct seeded plants only had one or two leaves. And whereas the transplanted ones had at least three, sometimes five or six. So we believe that's why. This is also really important. Not only were they colonizing the plants, but they were laying eggs and these eggs were hatching. And we had significantly more larvae in transplanted fields in June than we did in seeded fields. Now, this is important just by a numbers reason, but also remember that IYSV is not seed transmitted. And what stage can IYSV be acquired? Only during the larval stage. So these fields here, the direct seeded ones, even though there were larvae, they weren't acquire, acquiring the virus because it's not seed transmitted. And so this is basically a non-issue. Not necessarily the case in transplanted fields, because again, I just showed you, these plants may be coming and infected, larvae may acquire the virus, they mature to adulthood, and now you've got that little needle flying around in the landscape ready to infect plants, right? Oops. Okay, so to address this objective, we monitor the abundance of viriliferous onion thrips adults within and near potential IYSV source habitats, all right, both early and mid-season as a proxy for identifying that primary source. So these were the habitats that were monitored for viriliferous adults. We chose cull piles that had these volunteer onions, non-annual weeds that were found along ditch banks next to onion fields, and then transplanted fields. So here's a photo of a transplanted field that is matured naturally. Those onion leaves are falling down, uh, that's normal, okay, next to a seeded field where the crop is not nearly as mature, okay, and, and the crop is standing up. So we actually sampled, and when I say we, Ashley, sampled these, and this was considered a negative control, right, because again, it's not seed transmitted, so early on we wouldn't expect there to be uh, IYSV in these fields. So this was a two-year study, and each habitat was replicated four times. We chose to do this in the Elba Muck because we knew that this is where IYSV was more, most common in the state. And all of these little symbols in yellow represent these different habitats. And, and the point here is that they were all within the, in the Elba Muck where either there was an onion field or, or near an onion field, with the exception of three out of the four cull piles, which were here. All right, why were they outside of the Muck? Well, it's because they were right next to the packing sheds. And that's where culls go. The misshapen bulbs, the rotten bulbs all go right out the door into these cull piles. Uh, but we felt like, well, maybe a thrips could move a virus from these cull piles into the muck. We didn't know, but we, we wanted to sample those areas. So I just wanted to, to make that clear. The onion thrips adults were monitored using yellow sticky cards, all right, here, right here. And they were placed in all of these habitats and they were monitored weekly uh, in June and July. So what we did was we binned the information um, over those weeks in June to provide an estimate of early season activity and then in July for our mid-season activity. And then the adults captured on those sticky cards were removed and then assayed using RT-PCR to determine whether or not the insect was viriliferous or not viriliferous. And then the number of viriliferous adults was estimated based on the abundance of those on the sticky cards and the proportion of those that were testing positive for the virus. And in the interest of time, I'm only going to show you the results of one of those two years. All right, so in 2015. So on the y-axis, we have the total mean estimated number of adults testing positive for the virus per card. 
in the different habitats. So the cull pile here, the weedy area here, transplanted here, and seeded here. In June, early season, no differences. In fact, we hardly found anything that we would estimate to be viriliferous. That sure changed in July. <laughs> Significantly more adults were predicted to be viriliferous in transplanted onion fields compared with the other habitats. So essentially, we've got our smoking gun here. The transplanted onions were the major source for a virus in our landscape. If we look at New York State and the areas where plants imported from the southwestern US were established, only two locations. The black dirt area in Orange County and the elbow muck in Orleans County, 15% and 35% of the acreage transplanted respectively. So where do we see symptoms of iris yellow spot disease? In those two locations. Okay, so that's anecdotal information, but it pairs up pretty nicely with the empirical information of what we learned in the elbow muck. So to answer that first question, what are the primary or what is the primary infection source or sources? We have our answer onion fields transplanted with these imported plants from the southwestern U.S. Moving on now to the second one. What about spread of the virus from plant to plant? So our, our objective was to determine, well, do onion thrips engage in short distance dispersal that would allow them to spread the virus within and between fields? And our hypothesis was that onion thrips adults would primarily disperse, in fact, short distances. And to address this objective, we monitored the abundance of onion thrips adults in onion fields captured at different heights above the onion canopy as a proxy for the distance of dispersal. Now, let me explain. This is a cross section of the atmosphere. If you look at the bottom, the ground, okay, up to this dotted line here, which is SBL, which is the surface boundary layer, okay. So this SBL is two and a half times the height of the surrounding topography, which in, in our case that I'm talking about is onion fields, all right? So any onion thrips adults flying below that SBL would be predicted to be engaged in short distance dispersal. Anything above that line up to the free atmosphere would be predicted to engage in long distance flight. So during a nice sunny warm day, the Earth's surface heats up and you get these winds that go upward. And for a teeny tiny insect like a thrips or an aphid or a white fly, basically these insects then can travel upward. And then once they get into that free atmosphere, they can you know, get into those winds that are humming along pretty good. And these insects can literally move hundreds of miles. Then when temperatures cool, the winds go downward, and then that's when the insects basically drop out of the atmosphere back onto plants. All right, so bringing us back to the onion system. So here, uh, my former student, Eric Smith, constructed these six meter high poles, placed them in onion fields, and then put these translucent sticky cards. So we, we wanted to make sure that the thrips weren't attracted to them, so that they'd be captured just by accident, uh, passively, if you will, wrapped them around at these different heights where you see the yellow arrows. So a half meter all the way up to six meters. And then he monitored these sticky cards um, every day, sometimes multiple times a day, over the course of our onion growing season. Uh, the SBL was calculated to be two and a half times the height of the surrounding topography, which in this case is onions. We estimated that to be two meters. Again, in the interest of time, I'm only going to show you um, the, the basically the pooled results over a couple years. And just to orient you, now the dependent variable is actually on the x-axis. So this is the mean number of adults per card log transformed and then the altitude of those sticky cards above the soil surface, a half a meter above to six meters above. Our SBL here was at two meters. So a majority of the thrips that were captured on those sticky cards that were below the surface boundary layer. In fact, 96% of the thrips we captured over the course of the season were captured 
basically below that SBL, indicating that those threats were engaged in short distance dispersal. Very few were engaging in this long distance dispersal, 4%. So taking this a step further, we wanted to know, well, do these onion threats then, since they disperse short distances, do they then move from say a transplanted field that might have high levels of virus into an adjacent seeded field? And remember, you know, a, a small percentage of the landscape is transplanted. A majority is seeded, right? So we were worried that maybe the uh, threats were moving the virus into seeded fields, late, mid, uh, mid to late season. So what Eric did was he found a number of scenarios where there's a seeded field adjacent to an early maturing transplanted field or ones that were seeded as well, a similar maturity. And the prediction was that he would catch more or find more onion thrips on plants in this scenario than in this scenario, because the quality and suitability of the host here in this maturing transplanted field was poor, onion thrips were looking for something better and that they had reason to move, whereas they may not have reason to move from here to here. And indeed, that's exactly what he found in this three-year study, that there are more thrips on plants, on seeded plants next to the transplanted early maturing fields than those in a similar maturing seeded field. In fact, 54% more adults were captured in this scenario than in this scenario. So another interesting find was that we noticed that the progression, or actually no, that the percentage of onion thrips adults that were testing positive for the virus reflected what we saw in fields. And that was sometimes an exponential increase in, uh, in the virus. And in fact, look at this, 55% of the thrips we sampled in August tested positive. I mean, that's, that's unbelievably high. So that means that these critters are just moving um, into the landscape, moving from these transplanted fields into seeded ones. And, and a you know, high number of these are transmitting the virus to, uh, to plants. So to answer that second point about local spread from plant to plant, oh yeah, radioliferous thrips are definitely moving short distances and they certainly are moving from these transplanted, uh, uh, mature, excuse me, mature transplant fields into nearby uh, seeded ones. All right, then moving on to the very last point and that's can the virus be introduced to new locations like you know, far away locations? Uh, and obviously we, we knew that, yeah, they can be on a truck from Arizona to New York and they could be introduced that way, certainly. But we were curious to know, well, what about trips? Could trips move it uh, long distances? So our objective was to determine if onion thrips adults engage in long distance dispersal and if any of these trips were viriliferous. And the hypothesis was, yeah, we believe that trips also have the potential to disperse long distances. Now you may say, well, Brian, you just answered that question in the previous experiment. 4% of those thrips were captured on traps that were four meters and six meters above the canopy. So why are you doing this? I can't argue, you're right. I could have stopped there and said, yeah, well, sure, certainly can. But you know what? There's something that just isn't satisfying to say, yeah, I caught a trip six meters above the onions. Oh yeah, it was definitely headed off hundred miles away versus maybe catching the thrips 60 meters above the canopy. So that's what we did. We uh, actually used these unmanned aerial vehicles and flew them 60 meters above onion fields to see if we could catch any onion thrips. Figuring that if we catch them 60 meters above those onions, they are definitely headed long ways away from uh, these onion fields. So we collaborated with Elson Shields on this project because uh, he loves flying these planes. And what we did was we affixed Petri dishes to these wings and we coated the Petri dishes with sticky material. And then we flew these planes for 30 minutes at 60 meters above the onion canopy. And then after 30 minutes, we, we landed the planes and then uh, looked at the plates and then picked off any uh, onion threats. Now you may say, well, what about take off to 60 meters and then your descent from 60 meters to, to the ground. You know, we, you couldn't, you know, you, you might be picking up trips, right? And then you wouldn't answer your question. 
Well, Elson thought about this and basically fixed these guards. Now this guard is open right now. So this, when the plane was, would be flying at 60 meters, it would look like this. But on takeoff up to 60 meters and from 60 meters to landing, this guard basically would shielded the plates. And then it was uh, using remote control. Once we got it to 60 meters using remote control, we opened it up like you see here. So it's pretty slick. And here's what we found. And the study was conducted in two years in 2012 and 2013. Total number of onion thrips adults captured here. So in 2012, we caught 300 onion thrips. And um, in 2013, which was a year where it must have been cool and wet, we just didn't have very many thrips overall and uh, only caught about 20 thrips. But 20% and 15% of these thrips tested positive for IYC in 2012 and 2013, respectively. So do or do yeah, do onion strips have the capability of basically flying long distances and potentially establishing, you know, in another muck somewhere? Yes. Is the chance that they could then infect a plant with IYSV? Yes. We don't know for sure, but certainly that the possibility is, is there. So we concluded with answering all these questions. So we felt like we had a pretty good handle on onion thrips ecology and dispersal and IYSV epidemiology. Now let's use this information to develop management. So that's how I'm gonna finish up. Uh, this is a relatively simplistic illustration of the major components of in integrated or the tools in integrated pest management, cultural, chemical and biological controls and plant resistance. What I'm going to do is talk about each of these four major areas, how they pertain to managing thrips and IYSV. And I'm going to start with cultural control. Well, it, it seems like a no brainer to solve this problem. Stop bringing in transplants from the Southwestern US, right? <laughs> seems like that would be a pretty easy solution. And certainly there are some growers in New York that do grow their onions locally in greenhouses in the wintertime. Relatively small acreages, but it does happen. But our issue is some of our large scale growers. We have one grower that transplants a thousand acres of onions every year. Do the math, 130,000 plants per acre, that's 130 million onion plants transplanted every year. That's a lot. And right now we don't have the greenhouse space in New York. And also, let's face it, it is really cold in New York. And you have to start uh, these, um, the onions in the greenhouse like in December. Uh, so heating greenhouses, it basically it's too expensive. And um, until there's a way to maybe take advantage of geothermal uh, resources uh, to you know, basically be able to do this uh, more economically, these growers are still gonna import these plants from the Southwest. So um, I don't see this uh, being eliminated anytime soon. Another idea would be, what about harvesting all transplanted fields early before trips really come off of them and you see these exponential increases in IYSV in the landscape? Well, certainly that is done, but not all fields. Remember, these growers can't harvest everything at once. In fact, they, because of that, they choose varieties and they transplant certain acreages so that they can basically stagger when they harvest during the course of the season. So essentially, this just isn't practical in, in a lot of areas. What about clustering the transplanted fields in space? The idea here would be to concentrate and better predict the direction of dispersing viriliferous thrips and reduce the spread. So let me give you an example. So prior to the arrival of IYSV, an onion grower's farm may look something like this, where there are fields that would be trans, are, uh, harvested early in July, those maybe in August, and those finally in September. Well, basically the quality and the suitability of the hosts um, decline when that crop matures and those, those leaves fall over. So they go to the nearest nearby most attractive host, which is going to be 
the onion fields that are less mature, right? And in this scenario, 50% of the fields on this farm are going to be at risk for invasions of thrips and IYSV. More recently, after talking to the growers that have a lot of transplanted fields, they're now grouping them in the area, like in the Elba Muck, for example, and they're, they're basically positioning them like what I've shown here. So in this particular scenario, yeah, thrips are still going to be moving virus you know, to an adjacent field, but now it's more directional. You know where they're going. So on this farm, in this generic example, now only 10% of the fields are going to be at risk for an increase in thrips and IYSB pressure compared to 50% like they were previously. So now you can use border sprays, you can scout this field maybe first rather than this field, and you're going to have a better idea of the progression of both the thrips infestation and IOSV epidemics. So here's another idea. Well, maybe we can't prevent the spread of the virus, but maybe we can make our plants resistant so that we don't see yield loss. And one way to minimize plant stress is through water management. That would be to irrigate the crop when it's dry and remove water from fields when they're wet. Certainly with climate change, there's no doubt we have seen incredible uh, fluxes in our environment. We'll have summers where it doesn't stop raining and it's cool. And we have some summers where we can't get a drop of rain. And the growers realize this. And there's no doubt in the 20 years I've been in New York State, there is a, has been a huge investment in irrigation equipment. And also there's been a huge investment in ripping out that old tile and replacing it with much better, more resilient tile. So that when we get standing water, we, we, it won't last very long. And I have some videos of, of some water. You would think that some of these fields are lakes. I mean, you'd think the entire crop would be lost because they're a foot or more underwater. The next day, no water. So they, they have the ability to move, move water very quickly with these pumps and these really good um, uh, drainage systems. Another idea is to optimize plant health and improve nutrient management. This is an area, I'll be honest, I don't know much about, but one thing I do know is that our onion fields are rich in, fer in nutrients and these growers are just putting way too much fertilizer on. And I can't help but think that these plants are pretty wimpy as a, as, a, as a result. And maybe, you know, the virus is really having their way with it. And maybe if we make these plants a little tougher, maybe optimize nutrients, maybe they could ward off uh, the virus a little bit better. Moving on now to chemical control. We've made tremendous advancements in how to use insecticides to kill onion thrips and to reduce IYSV. And these guidelines are predicated on solid insecticide resistance management principles. We have a number of effective products that belong to novel classes of chemistry to use in rotational programs. We've identified action thresholds that can be used for each of these products. Those that don't work all that well, we have a more conservative threshold. For those that work really well, we can tolerate more threats. We have a little bit more liberal threshold. Works really well. And we have identified sequences of these products that can be used for season-long control. Here we have the 2021 guidelines for onion trips management in onion. Now, at first glance, you may go, oh my gosh, this is way too complicated. A grower is never going to follow this nightmare. Well, you know what? They do, and it's not a nightmare. So essentially, it's a flow chart, a flow decision chart. It starts at the top early in the season, and it progresses to the end of the season. There are some things um, that are assumed. Number one is that a grower doesn't need more than six applications over the course of the season. And number two, that an insecticide is only sprayed when, there's an act, when the population exceeds an action threshold of one thrips per leaf, unless otherwise specified. So, you know, that way, you know, they don't have to spray six times, they can spray twice, all right? The other factor is that this is tailored to basically different seasons that experience different thrips populations. In a cool wet year, you're not gonna have as many thrips. Option A is gonna be a track that's gonna be maybe fairly popular. 
in a year where it's hot and dry in May and you just have these huge populations of thrips developing, you may have to use option C. And then option B may be something in between. The other factor is that we know certain insecticides work early in the season and not later in the season. And then some really work best when thrips populations are high and versus when they're low. And this, these guidelines account for all of those factors. And you know what? It works really well. So uh, a project that Ashley and Christy Hopin, who's a Cornell Crop and Extension Aider, and I conducted was a survey to look at the adoption of these guidelines. So the growers were given a survey before the three-year study and after the three-year study. And what we learned was that the number, those that followed these guidelines, the number of insecticide sprays were reduced by 12 to 50%. And the growers that used the guidelines saved on, eight, on average $60 per acre in insecticide costs, which really isn't all that much. But if you expand it to you know, the entire farm, eh, you, know, you might be able to buy a new pickup truck at the end of the season with it, what they say. Um, and then also, you know what? We haven't seen resistance to some of the best products like Radiant. So eh, we can't say for sure that, that this program is why we haven't seen resistance but we can't say that we can. All right, moving on to how in chemicals can impact virus. So here's a study uh, that Ashley conducted where in late July, we see the percent incidence of symptoms of iris yellow spot virus were significantly lower in plots that were treated with insecticides fo following an action threshold or a weekly insecticide program compared with ones that weren't treated at all. Now, two weeks later is all at 100% because once these epidemics get rolling, uh, it's a train that will not stop, okay? However, remember that like a lot of impacts that pathogens have on crops, that if you can delay the incidence and maybe severity until that crop is more mature, you're not gonna see maybe as great of impacts on yield. If you look at another factor, which is the severity of the symptoms, again, we see much lower, well, much lower, okay, significantly lower, it's still relatively high, but less severity of IYS in insecticide treated plots compared with those that aren't treated. And then the bottom line is yield. We see significantly greater yield when insecticides are applied than when they aren't. Now, granted, I think the impact here not only indicates a delay in the incidence of IYS symptoms, the reduction in severity, but you know what? Also, there are fewer thrips. So you can't disentangle the impact that insecticides have on thrips versus the impact that it had on the virus. But so I'll concede that point. But nonetheless, uh, it, it does show that insecticides can be used as a tool to uh, reduce incidence and severity of the virus. One idea that we were really excited about early on, and not just in New York, but elsewhere, were plant inducers like Actigard, with the idea being that this would stimulate the plant's defense response, the systemic acquired resistance, to ward off the negative impacts that the virus had on the plant. Unfortunately, it was a swing and a mess. Moving on now to biocontrol. So I had a master's student in my program, Elaine Falk, now Elaine uh, uh, Landers, who conducted a survey over a couple of years in commercial onion fields, where she surveyed whether or not natural enemies were in commercial fields and then what she found. And you know what? Found a fairly decent diversity of natural enemies with predaceous thrips as number one, but they were at relatively low densities and certainly not densities that would really have any impact on providing adequate control of onion thrips. So right now, biocontrol in terms of uh, conservation biocontrol, I don't see that really being a factor, but perhaps you know, animal pathogens, uh, that could be an area that, that has not been explored that could have maybe more traction if environmental conditions are right. And then finally, plant resistance. And let's face it, plant resistance should be the cornerstone, the bedrock, whatever you, know, you wanna say uh, for IPM. And unfortunately, high levels of IYSV resistance 
have not been identified in onion. There are some cultivars that are mildly resistant, but none that are flat out highly resistant. And that's true also for thrips. There are cultivars that maybe are partially resistant to thrips, but not totally. We do know what the characteristics are that confer resistance to thrips. So for example, onions that are partially resistant to thrips typically have a yellow color, which is associated with low levels of wax. So they have kind of this glossy appearance and yellow green color that have a little bit more wax, semi-glossy leaves. And maybe most importantly, is that they have low levels of this H16 ketone. So the varieties that are highly susceptible to thrips have a blue-green leaf color, lots of wax, and high levels of this H16 ketone. Onion thrips aren't the only thing that onion thrips have to deal with. In the eastern US, we have high humidity, we have a lot of rainfall. You know what that good, that's good for? Foliar pathogens. And what we see is that these waxes, high levels of waxes provide a physical barrier to these pathogens. Now, it doesn't prevent them, but it certainly helps. So what we see are with these glossy leaf cultivars, they melt uh, due to some of the foliar pathogens that we have in New York. Um, the somewhat glossy ones, not as bad, but certainly not as good as the, the ones that have a lot of wax. So really the sweet spot in the breeding programs now is to produce a variety that is considered semi-glossy, as much wax as you can put on that leaf that has the lowest levels of H16 ketone as possible. And efforts are being under, are underway right now to do that. So right now, our onion growers have essentially two tactics that work somewhat well, cultural control and chemical control. And we've been really successful in getting our growers to implement this IPM for both thrips and IYSV. So uh, it involves a lot of personal interaction with the growers. It takes Cornell Cooperative Extension educators who are really into onions <laughs> and very excited about onions like Christy Hope team. And um, in working with them closely, um, it really pays off. And just as an example, uh, the New York State IPM program awarded the Elba Growers the 2019 Excellence in IPM Award. Future management of thrips and IYSV. I think, as I alluded to earlier, I think you know there's more work that needs to be done on improving plant health to minimize IYSV symptoms. Uh, there's a, a cooperator at New Mexico State University that is looking at this, uh, primarily looking at the water management aspect. Developing cultivars through traditional breeding that are highly resistant to IYSV and thrips. Potentially in the future, maybe using genetic modification uh, to create thrips resistant cultivars. You know, there's a BT strain or toxin, um, this cry toxin that has been incorporated into cotton that is toxic to certain thrip species. And for others, it will reduce or make them, um, well, actually somewhat repellent uh, to those thrip species. And also they don't lay as many eggs. Maybe that would be useful for onion thrips and onion. And then technologies like RNAi and CRISPR. You know, and potentially, you know, a foliar application of an RNAi product that would kill um, onion thrips and prevent them from transmitting IYSV. Hey, yeah, maybe that, that would work. So in summary then, we, we know what the where the primary source for virulifers thrips is in our landscape, and that's fields transplanted with imported onion plants. We know how thrips are spreading the virus, short distance dispersal, and they're moving it primarily from these early maturing fields that are transplanted into uh, nearby seeded ones. We know that there is the potential for onion thrips to move IYSV to other production regions through this long distance dispersal. And then finally, onion growers are taking advantage of cultural and chemical tactics to manage both thrips and reduce virus a, a bit, but you know, a further improvement is certainly needed. Like I said, I've been working on this since 2007. Uh, tons of people have come through my program that have had some role 
minor or major in this project. The onion growers have been extremely gracious, allowing us to do this research in their fields and other industry representatives. And then a number of federal, state, and commodity board funding sources for this work. Before I open up to questions, uh, whoo, sorry, I didn't know it was that late. Um, I do want to mention that Art in Yellow is uh, retiring. And uh, we've already got the green light to refill that position. So we will soon be officially announcing a tree fruit entomologist position. It will be at Agritech, uh, an assistant or associate professor rank, tenure track, 60% research, 40% extension. Greg Loeb is the search chair. That's the contact information. And I'd certainly be happy to talk to you about it uh, as well. So with that, um, again, sorry, I, I guess I went on, off on some tangents, but maybe we have a little bit of time to answer some questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Maybe I can see you all. Maybe I can't. <laughs> um, at any rate, at this point, Ashley, I'm, I'm going to let you direct me if I should go right to the Q&A or chat. What, what would you like me to do? Let's go ahead and go with the Q&A and let's uh, maybe do questions for a couple minutes because I know you have a meeting at noon. So okay, just sure. give yourself a break if you need it. I, I just need one minute. That's all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anybody who wants to stick around and listen to some of the answers Brian will have for the questions, feel free to do so. If not, um, totally understand if you want to um, peace out for right now. Um, sure. so the first question um, is, is anything being done by growers and nurseries to help prevent infestation from imported transplants? So something like uh, what we might consider with any type of virus um, uh, program. I, I, fantastic question. Um, unfortunately, no. And I've actually been to uh, the farm in Arizona where most of the onion plants are coming in. And I talked with the, the farmer there that, that grows these and, you know, looking at the landscape, there wasn't anything to me that stood out like, ah, there's the source. They're coming in from these weeds or this alfalfa crop or these cotton plants or whatever. Um, I, there wasn't anything apparent, but certainly there's got to be something there. Um, and early on, the grower wasn't spraying them with insecticides before they were moved to um, New York. That has since changed. So we rarely see onion thrips coming in on these plants. Um, but it's not like they're testing the plants ahead of time or anything like that. Did you have a question, Ashley? Or? Yeah, well, can we punch them with Moveno right before they leave? Or right, you know, maybe two weeks before they leave? Because, so, you know. Yep, yep. So, so you know, hit, hitting with an insecticide like Movento, uh, so those that you don't know about Movento, it's systemic and it's incredibly effective against larvae. So, um, so that, that would be something, but here's the deal. In terms of resistance management, um, you know, if any thrips escape that or become resistant, then we could, they could arrive being resistant in New York. But nonetheless, um, that, that would be a possibility. The grower would have to spend uh, probably more money than the grower would like. Um, and let's face it, once he sells the, the plants to the growers in New York, not his problem. Um, if he had another competitor, like the one in Texas, for example, would you know have virus-free plants, then maybe there would be more of a, a reason. Unfortunately, you can't identify an infected plant, so you can't rogue them out. And in terms of regulation, there is no regulation at this point. We already have IYSV; it's in our landscape already. So you know that 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 ship has sailed already, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so another question that was asked is what makes onion thrips the lone vector in these systems? So maybe just comment about, uh, you know, thrips transmitting IYC because yeah. obviously there's a difference between onion thrips and Franklinella, for example. Absolutely. Another very good question. So there's, there are two, two parts to this. Number one is there is one other species that has been shown to effectively transmit IYSV to another plant. It was a greenhouse study in Georgia. The virus is moved from a lysianthus, or no, from an onion plant to a lysianthus plant. Mm -hmm. There's been no documentation of, on, or, of uh, another species of thrips moving the virus from onion to onion. Okay, so that's one thing. Why? Not really sure uh, why that is exactly. Um, but, but anyway, that's, that's been the case and other species have been examined. In our system, like a lot of other systems, we're only dealing with one thrip species. Thank goodness. Um, yeah, we, we do have Western flower thrips in our landscape. 
They're not interested in onions. It's, it's like finding a needle in a haystack to find basically a, an, uh, a uh, say Western flower thrips in an onion field, feeding on an onion plant. So as, luckily we're only re really dealing with it, that one species. Uh, the next question from Doug, um, he is asking about the insecticides specifically that are being used in onion production and noting that some of them are known behavior mod modifiers. So um, potentially what's the chance of these insecticides interfering with the ability of the thrips to transmit the virus, even though they might survive the exposure? Another really, really good question, Doug. Um, so <laughs> last spring, we had aspirations to look at exactly what, what you're talking about. So for, exa for example, azadiractin is known to be a repellent and also potentially an overposition deterrent in, for some insects and some crops. So what we wanted to do was have some growers spray certain fields early in the season during the time when thrips are colonizing our transplanted fields and, and hit it with say an azadirect or nemazole or something like that. And then other fields where you don't, do that. And then we'll watch the progression of IYSV in that field and maybe a neighboring field. But because of COVID, we had to drop some things and that was one of the first things to go. So we'll see if we can resurrect it. Um, to, to be honest with you, logistically, it's going to need to be done really on a, a field scale basis. Uh, and, and we have growers that are willing to do it, but, but to actually be uh, really know for sure how it's working is going to be a little bit tricky, uh, but but certainly it's a really good question, a good idea, and I, I think it does need to be follow up, followed up on. So the next question is regarding plant stress and how that basically um, impacts this iris aerosolous spot disease. Um, so is it because a healthy plant can tolerate virus infection better or is it because the thrips population growth is higher on stressed plants or is it a combination of both? Yep. I, I, another really, really good question. Um, okay, so uh, I, I guess the short answer, I'm gonna say both. Um, so what I, what I don't know is if a healthy plant can tolerate virus better but I, I, if I had to guess, I would say yes. It's kind of, I'm using a human analogy, right? If, if a human isn't stressed, we can get the virus, we can get COVID and have mild symptoms, but if we're really stressed, we end up in the, in the ER. Again, I, my guess is it's relatively similar for a plant. Um, and best, uh, what I've seen, certainly with, with drought stress, man, you see terrible symptoms and, um, and if, um, due to IYSV compared with a year that's it's, uh, under you know, more optimal growing conditions. Uh, we do know that if we um, if we cut back on fertilizer, for example, uh, we we don't unfortunately see a, a significant drop in the thrips population, but it may be that we just haven't dropped it enough. Um, so uh, again, I think there's more work that needs to be done on trying to find an optimization of, of say fertilizer in our system to see you know how that really impacts thrips populations. So I, I think I kind of answered it. And I think with the potassium work that they're doing out west too is very indicative that like the plant stress is a massive component. If we can keep that plant healthy for longer, I think they're able to fight off that infection. So I think you're absolutely right. That's a great point. Um, so the other question is, would it be practical for onion growers to plant tall barrier strips of non-host grasses between mature plantings and seeded fields? With the idea uh, of being yeah. able to kind of limit the amount of dispersal. Right, right. Um, I'm very pessimistic. And, and the reason I say that is that, and, um, and maybe you kind of got a sense for uh, one of the pictures, I know it's kind of small, but at least in the elbow production region where we seem to have a lot of virus, that there's actually natural wind, not natural, uh, uh, established wind breaks of willow and these willow plantings basically separate the, um, the onion fields. And they, they keep them mowed. Sometimes they're mowed lower. Sometimes they get actually pretty tall. And, and I've looked into this and I've looked at thrips populations on one side of the, the uh, willow barrier and the other, and, I, and those thrips go right over it. Um, so I really haven't seen much of a difference. And even if there's something even taller, um, I, you know, the, the short distance dispersal seems to be you know, they, they, it doesn't seem to be enough of a barrier, I guess is what I'm saying. If maybe it's an entire field of some other crop, um, I, I think that would work. But, or even 
you know, I don't know, 50 feet or 100 feet of some other like corn or something like that, um, you know, around the fields, then yeah, maybe it could have uh, maybe more of a, an impact. But at this point, um, I, I don't see growers going to the, those efforts at this point. It have the situation would have to get even worse than it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Brian. Very much appreciate your time today. Absolutely. And if I didn't get to everybody's questions, you know, I absolutely I think you feel got free them. to send me an email. Yeah. I think you got them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay.